Welcome, Miko Pellet, back to the mother of all talk shows. I have uh, had a, a, a difficult 48 hours on social media under full assault. They, they moved the, the, the target uh, now and again, and it was just my bad luck to have Christmas as the, as the number one target. But one of the startling new developments uh, was the accusation or the claim that Israel are the anti-colonialists, that they are returning uh, to the land that they were driven from 2,000 years ago. Ergo, they are the anti-colonialists, not those of us opposed uh, to the apartheid state uh, formed by European colonizers in Palestine. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, it's great to be with you again. Thanks for inviting me. It's it's been it's been a while, so it's good to see you again. And yeah. uh, you know, it's it's really funny about I don't know when was it that Netanyahu was reelected the last time, and he was in the U.S. doing all the talk shows, and he was uh, actually he updated that history. By the way, he has a new update, which is that the Arabs came to Palestine in the sixth century and kicked out the Jews and colonized it. And they were engaged in ethnic cleansing and apartheid and all kinds of, you know, uh, you know, the world according to Netanyahu, the world according to the Zionists. I mean, it never ends because when your entire existence is justified by a lie, when your entire, when your entire uh, narrative is based on a lie, you have to keep updating it all the time. You have to keep changing it all the time. You have to build lies upon lies. The beauty of the, you know, support of, of, of the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian call for justice is that it's based on simplicity and truth. You know, the call for the Palestinians to, for the call for justice and freedom, uh, uh, the call for liberation in, of Palestine, the call for a, a democratic Palestine, an all of historic Palestine with equal rights is actually very simple. And it calls for something that will benefit everybody who lives within, between the river and the sea. But of course, they can't accept that because that will lead to peace and will lead to, you know, a, a, a future for Israelis and Palestinians. But since they don't want that, they have to keep building and building and building lies upon lies upon lies, spend billions and billions of dollars to pretend that these lies are somehow true. Just have all these people out there speaking, you know, attacking people like yourself, attacking me, attacking everybody who dare stand in their way, uh, just to justify their lies, just to pretend that their lies are truth. So it must be very difficult for them. But you know, they the lies just keep up being updated. There's never there's no end to it whatsoever. And of course, it's not true. There's nothing to do. The, no, the the, the is a settler colonial uh, ideology. Well, I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, the idea of people uh, who claim that they originated somewhere, uh, although in truth a significant number of them must have converted to the religion somewhere else and have no uh, actual DNA connection to the area, that would be a recipe for a total chaos in world affairs. The Romans could come back to England and say they were they were driven out of England by by Boadica, uh, and uh, and they were coming back to claim their birthright. Uh, it is a perfect nonsense, but a surprising number of apparently educated and intelligent people entertain this kind of nonsense, Miko. What's it all about, really? Well, I think there are two things. One is, like you said, that there's, a, there's a great deal of ignorance, and even people who are educated can be stupid. And so that's that. The, there's no there's no contradiction there. And even if they are educated, it doesn't mean that they're educated on this on every single issue. And you know, and and so there, there, there are a lot of reasons why people are are uh, Ill, either ill informed or are, are, are tr lying. I mean, so you've got the paid informants, the paid spokespeople, the Dershowitzes, if you will, of the world, who are out there spewing this nonsense because they they um, they are basically racist and, and full of hate and and, and hate Palestinians and 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 are glad to see the destruction and the death of Arabs and so on. And then you get people, I think, who are, who are perfectly um, innocently ignorant. And, and I think one of the problems that this, that this, that this, um, that we're faced with right now is that there, well, on the one hand, there's a very compelling story 
out there, which is the Zionist narrative. The Jews returning after 2,000 years after the Holocaust and rebuilding and building this wonderful state that's modern and democratic and so on. And then there is no real effort. There is no, you know, a, a, a strong effort like the Zionists have to push forward the other narrative, the other story, which is the true story. There's no equivalent to the different lobbies and the different groups that the Zionists have around the world that are perpetuating on a, on a, system, in a systemic way, in a, in a methodical way, um, in a, in, through, an, through a, some kind of an establishment. There's no answer to that on the Palestinian side. There's nobody doing that. That's never been done. And you know we're working here in Washington D.C. to try to remedy that, to create something here in Washington D.C. that will just present the other side in a compelling. I mean, it's a compelling story anyway, but in a way that is systemic, so that it's out there. So in case you do have somebody, an American politician or somebody who just wants to make an informed decision, that they have the other story in front of them, because right now they don't. I'm glad you. Uh mentioned what is now quite a stark dichotomy. When I first became involved in this subject 50 years ago, uh, the Israeli lobby or supporters used to boast about Israel's social democratic character, even socialist character. They talk yeah. about the kibbutzim, a kind of primitive communism. Uh, they talk about the importance of the histadrut, the trade unions, the uh, ruling Israeli Labour Party was affiliated to the Socialist International and so on. Nowadays, the supporters of Israel, I mean, it's like a cesspit of racial hatred, of uh, anti-Muslim hatred, of anti-Arab uh, racism, and it's just so degenerate. It's like as the Israeli state degenerated, so has the mentality, the discourse of their supporters. You must be acutely aware of that. Yes, and I think, uh, I, I think if we're to be honest, the, the type of socialism that the early, you know, those who established, my grandparents' generation, my parents' generation, who established and ran the country for the first few decades, they were closer to national socialists than they were to socialists. They were closer to national socialism than they were to socialism. Um, because they excluded the indigenous population. I mean, they kicked out as many as they could, and then they excluded the ones who remained from, from any of the benefits of, of the state that they created. So they weren't really socialists, and for reasons beyond understanding, the world allowed them to get away with it. I mean, when you think about this, look, I mean, you know this, uh, the, three years after the Holocaust, three years after the end of World War II, the world allowed an apartheid state to be formed, a brutal campaign of ethnic cleansing was allowed to take place in Palestine, which is, you know, a, a high place of, of a very high fo you know, focal point. Um, and it was allowed to happen. I mean, the massacres, we don't even know how many were, were, were killed in these massacres in 1948. And the ethnic cleansing got, you know, the horror stories. And an apartheid state was established in Palestine three years after the end of the genocide of the Jews in Europe, of Europe. I mean, it's unbelievable. And the world just sat down and, and, and welcomed it and allowed it to happen. And of course, the rest of the world, gradually, the entire world uh, ended up supporting this, this thing. And like you said, even socialists, people who are real socialists, real, you, you know, believers in equality and, and, and justice, were supporting this thing and would come to visit. It's an artist, you know, Mikis Todorakis and Joan Baez and all these big names who are known for being progressive came to Israel to perform. You know, they thought that the kibbutzim were a miracle and so forth. And somehow the fact that they erased the Palestinian people, they erased Palestine, the fact that they've been engaged in genocide, I mean, the erasure of a people, culturally, physically, in every other way, didn't even come, didn't even surface, didn't even bother any of these people. And to me, that is unbelievable. You know, so today, of course, like you said, they're, 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 their rhetoric is much more violent. Their rhetoric is much more honest, We should say, I should say. Uh, and 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 very clear. In those days, they pretended to want peace. They pretended they were somehow again socialist, loving people, and so on. But they were no different then than they are now, other than the rhetoric, really. And the world allowed it to happen. The, a friend of mine, Bill Spears, now departed, uh, used to say that the kibbutzim are to socialism 
as a group of thieves agreeing to distribute their spoils equally. Uh, but of course, these kibbutzim were built on stolen land. Uh, the 700,000 displaced in the catastrophe uh, are now 1,400,000 displaced in Gaza. You know, as I do, how small is Gaza? 1.4 million of them have been displaced. Their houses destroyed. The pictures from northern Gaza today show, frankly, a desert, uh, a wasteland. Uh, it is uh, the abandonment of all pretense, isn't it? Yes, and many of those refugees who are in Gaza now they used to live in that in the in the villages in the towns that existed where these a lot of these kibbutzim like kibbutz Be'eri that was attacked you know very heavily kibbutz zikim which is just north and i actually have family in both of these kibbutzim and i was spent a lot of time there growing up and so on these are just beautiful lovely communities you know with green grass and swimming pools and you know people running kids running freely barefoot all day and no not, not a not a worry in the world and just a few short kilometers away, they've created this 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 you know massive concentration camp, even before the you know the latest uh, the latest attack. But from the very beginning, it's really what it was. It was a concentration camp for refugees. And I remember growing up and visiting these places and enjoying them very much with my family. And never a word was said about what is going on a few kilometers away. And the fact that those people over there in these camps, these refugees. We're, we're sitting on their land. We're enjoying their land. We're enjoying their water, you know, and it's it's just unbelievable. And, and another thing is the kibbutzim, particularly in that part of the country, around Gaza and in the southern part of the country, the Nakab, they enjoy one of the high, some of the highest standards of living among Israelis, you know, because the Nakab is a very fertile is a very fertile desert. So, and none, none of this ever was ever brought up. The fact that these people over there are watching. And, and and seeing their land being taken, being cultivated, homes being built, and people living, enjoying really a wonderful, a very high standard of living, while the people whose land this is are not even permitted to visit. They're not, you know, they're, if they're lucky, they're permitted to work. And the kibbutzim, as, as you know, initially they did not hire labor. But later on, many of them realizing that there's much more profit in hired labor, uh, allowed the Palestinians whose land this was to come and cultivate the land and be there and be the laborers who who were paid pittance and then would go back to the refugee camps. And so the, the hypocrisy of the kibbutzim and the hypocrisy of this of of everything really that is said about Israel uh from its from the very beginning is just astounding. It's just really, really astounding. And and it's it comes at a price, the price that we're seeing now, tens of thousands of Palestinians being murdered like this. You know, this is number one, it's not new. And number two, it's It's just horrifying. This is a heavy price is being paid to allow Israel to pretend that it's this, you know, miracle and, and so on. The, uh, you know, I, I was born in the shadow of World War II and uh, into uh, a socialist family. So uh, the events of the Second World War have uh, cast a, a shadow and an endless fascination for me. I, I can't stop watching the liberation of Berlin, even though I know the ending. Uh, but one of the things that struck me while you were speaking there was, uh, and I've, I resisted for decades under instruction from my, my, my leaders, uh, the comparison of Israeli behavior, the nature of the Israeli state, and actual Hitler fascism and its conduct in the Holocaust, the greatest crime of the 20th century. But as somebody pointed out today on social media, if, if, if you don't like being called Nazis, stop behaving like Nazis. But they are behaving like Nazis in Gaza right now, aren't they? You know, it's again, the problem is always in what you call them, not in what they do. So they don't like apartheid. <laughs> and they fight about the word apartheid. They don't try to stop the apartheid. They don't like ethnic cleansing. They don't like settler colonialism, but that's precisely what they do. Whatever it is that, how, however it is that we define them, they don't like the definition. Their argument is always about the word. They never try, like you say, they never try to stop the actions that are actually the, the you know the, the expression of what it is that we're calling. You know, it's the action comes first, and then people are are, are making the comparisons. 
I mean, you know, it's 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 horrifying. It's horrifying. And then they get into all these arguments. Well, the Nazis were worse. The Nazis did more. The Nazis did this. The the apartheid wasn't exactly the same. The apartheid was this. You know, what I mean, they get into these nonsensical arguments about the definition instead of understanding, which of course they, I, I believe they do understand. They don't want to admit that they are in guy engaged in massive crimes against humanity, and they've been doing so since three years after the Holocaust. In other words, they began three years after the Holocaust ended engaging in, in in three horrifying crimes against humanity, the ethnic cleansing, the genocide, and the apartheid regime. All three are crimes against humanity. These are horrifying crimes that they've been engaged in from the very beginning. And again, the best they can do is come and argue whether it is apartheid or it isn't apartheid, whether it is this or it isn't that. And, you know, that's, that's all they can do. But the problem is they're being allowed to do this. This is allowed, this is being allowed to continue the, the, I think the the chief of the U.S. of the of the of the, of the English army is now in Tel Aviv, sitting with his counterpart, the Israeli counterpart. I mean, these are things that really? are just unbelievable, and everybody knows what's going on. You know, it's all over the place. I don't think anybody has any doubt that these are horrifying crimes against humanity. Um, and uh, every every conversation, every interview, almost begins with, "Do you condemn the Palestinians?" It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, uh, Netanyahu was open this morning to Likud. He said he's working on transfer uh, of the uh, of the of the population. In other words, you might you might not call it ethnic cleansing, but ethnic cleansing is clearly what it is. If you transfer people off their land uh, into other countries, and it's said that Netanyahu's government is bribing African and Latin American countries to uh, take these uh, people that will be transferred out. Do you think this will succeed? Do you think they'll be able to bribe or browbeat Egypt, Jordan, and other countries around the world to actually allow uh, the ethnic cleansing of Gaza? I don't. And you know, the, the, the Palestinian member of Knesset, Ahmed Tibi, gave a speech, I think it was yesterday, you know, where the, the prime minister residence is on a crossroad with a major street in West Jerusalem, which is called Gaza Road, funny enough. And uh, Dr. Mohamed Tevi said, uh, Netanyahu will be kicked out of Gaza Street before Palestinians will, will, will leave Gaza. You know, they're not going to go anywhere. The Palestinians will not leave. They will die. Another friend of my Palestinian friends, a friend of mine, Yusuf Jamal, wrote a piece uh, a few weeks ago that the the, the road to hev heaven is closer than the Sinai. The Palestinians are not leaving. And uh, sadly enough, the entire world is allowing them to be killed, you know, like this, you know, tens of thousands be, you know, being killed. And they're allowing this conversation to go on. In other words, no, there's no consequence for Netanyahu speaking like this. There's no consequence for the Israelis speaking like this openly. And of course, there's no consequence for the actions either. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing horrific things. And once again, you know, look, watching it in context for 75 years, they've been doing this and they're being, and they're being allowed to do this. And granted, in the beginning, perhaps they weren't as honest about, about their intentions. Um, uh, Palestinians aren't going anywhere. I think the King of Jordan made it absolutely clear that um, the that the that Jordan and Egypt will not will not allow this to happen, and uh, and he said this in the very very beginning. And I don't I don't believe the, uh, the Palestinians will will go. And and the thing is, you know, to to people, the, part of the Zionist narrative is that the problem is that Jordan Jordan and Egypt are the problem because they won't allow the Palestinians to go. Or the Arab countries where the Palestinian refugees refugee camps exist are the problem because they won't allow the Palestinians to become, you know, the problem is Israel. The problem has always been Israel. Israel is the initial crime. Israel does not allow the refugees to return. Israel has been murdering refugees in their camps in Palestine and around Palestine for decades. Israel caused the problem. And somehow everybody is allowing Israel as, as being as allowing Israel to parade itself as though it is some kind of a miracle, some kind of a wonderful democracy, liberal democracy, and nobody is standing up. I mean, seriously, how is it that nobody has called for sanctions against the state of Israel? How is it nobody has called for a no-fly zone over Gaza yet? How is it that the Sixth Fleet, that you know, the U.S. Navy Sixth Fleet that is in the Mediterranean, is not there to protect Palestinians? 
to protect this massacre of tens of thousands of Palestinians and stop this genocide. How is it that that is not the conversation? How is it that you know the UK, which has which has naval vessels in the Mediterranean, isn't coming in to to step in to stop this massacre of Palestinians? That is to me the the most unbelievable. And these are and this is also something that the, these countries and these leaders are going to pay for later on because they will have to answer for this. They will answer for this. This is not going to, you know, our, our kids, our grandkids are going to demand answers and they're going to demand justice. But how is it that this hasn't happened yet? How is it that there are no calls in the European Parliament to stop this, to stop this, to, to protect and defend the Palestinian people? There's no guarantees for the safety and security of Palestinians anywhere in Palestine, whether they're citizens of, of the state of Israel, whether they're in the West Bank, there is no one guaranteeing their protection. You can kill a Palestinian in the middle of the day, in the middle of the street, and you will be considered a hero. This is, to me, the most the most astounding issue here. Uh, finally, Miko, a, a personal question. Uh, I, I used to know a lot of Israelis like you, uh, not as brave, not as eloquent, uh, perhaps, but down Shankin Street, the people from Yesh Gavul uh, who refused to fight in the Lebanon war and so on. Uh, I had breakfast with one who's now in Paris, asked about another one who's moved to uh, Lisbon. Uh, uh, you are in Washington. Are there any Israelis like you left in Israel? And how would you quantify them quali uh, in terms of their numbers? and indeed the quality of the analysis? You know, that's a difficult question. I mean, I appreciate the compliments. Um, the uh, There is a small group of, of progressive Israelis who are, who, are, who are, you know, getting beaten and, 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 and being arrested and, and so on. There are... Uh, but but it's a very 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 small number. We ha we do have the, probably maybe even the most courageous community that exists within Jewish community that exists within Palestine are the ultra orthodox community who have been who have been resisting uh, Zionism from the very beginning and they do protest and they refuse to serve in the military and they get beaten and they get their their the neighborhoods get raided by the police in ways that remind us. Of, of 1930s uh, Germany. I mean, it's unbelievable what, what the Israeli police and the Israeli authorities do to this community. And they start staying firm and they have protests every single week. And to me, they might be the most, you know, the, the bravest Jewish community that lives within Palestine right now. There is a small group of people and they, you know, they'll publish an article here and there and they'll do an interview here and there. But they are, it's an insignificant number. It's a completely insignificant number. And the vast majority of what used to be called the left uh, in at least in Israeli terms, used to be called the left. They were Zionist left, and they opted to remain Zionist and 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 disregard the left, and disregard the peace, and remain Zionist. And today they are serving. Many of them are serving, happy to serve in in this, uh, participate in this uh, in the slaughter in Gaza. Very sad. Very sad indeed, Miko Pellet. Very very good to see you again. Let's not leave it so long before you're back Good with us. You. Thanks very Thank much you. indeed. Thank you. For joining us. I really enjoyed our conversation. I would have let it go on even longer, but we've got a lot of people on the line, a very large lot of people. 